Welcome back to the fourth episode in the series where I hunt or kill every Elder Dragon in Monster Hunter, spanning all the games within the series. Today I will cover the, all the Elder Dragons in the fourth generation of Monster Hunter games. There are 19 Elder Dragons in Gen 4, with 8 new additions and 11 returning Elders from the previous generations. For this video, I only played Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate and Monster Hunter GU, as I didn't see the point in playing through Monster Hunter Gen or Monster Hunter 4. However, I will still cover each game and the changes made from game to game. The Elder Dragons found in the 4th generation of Monster Hunter games are incredible, including the largest monster in the entire series, a couple of siege fights and some really cool designs. So without further ado, here is how I killed every Elder Dragon in Monster Hunter. Within Gen 4, there are four games, Monster Hunter 4, Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, Monster Hunter Generations, and Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate. I've noticed that the fourth generation of Monster Hunter games reintroduced a lot of Elder Dragons from the first and second generations. This trend would continue into the fifth generation, with fifth gen also bringing back first and second gen Elders. Fourth gen had an increased focus on verticality and movement, and this was most evident in the first game within this specific generation and its expansion, 4 and 4 Ultimate. This is because of the movement within the game. It feels more fluid than any other game prior to this. Monster Hunter Gen introduced Hunter Arts and Styles. Hunting Arts are a series of different abilities that are usable with every weapon and need to be charged up by filling a gauge, meaning that it mashed up the playstyle of each weapon, adding a whole new host of moves to each weapon. Hunting styles are different to hunting arts, as they completely changed up the gameplay of each weapon, with there being 6 styles, 4 introduced in Monster Hunter Generations and another 2 in Generations Ultimate. They greatly increase the depth of each weapon. They are Guild Style, Striker Style, Aerial Style, Adept Style, Valor Style and Alchemy Style. Overall, Generation 4 stands as the last old generation in the series before World. Gen 4 showed what the Monster Hunter team was capable of, and how they continue to change and try new things throughout the Monster Hunter series. I am the least familiar with the 4th generation of Monster Hunter games, but I still managed to beat 4 Ultimate and GU, so if I get some things wrong or incorrect, that is most likely why. Monster Hunter 4 has 9 Elder Dragons, 4 brand new Elder Dragons, and 5 returning Elders. The new Elders include Daran Moran, Shigaru Magala, Dala Madur, and Oroshi Kirin. In a first for the series, one of the Elder Dragons is the very first monster you encounter in the game, with Daran Moran serving as the introduction to Monster Hunter 4. Even though this section of the video talks about Elder Dragons from Monster Hunter 4, I still want to include 4 ultimate information for the Monster Hunter 4 Elders. This is because I don't want to dedicate a whole new section going over the 4 ultimate changes when I could include the changes the Elders went through in the 4 section. Overall, I think the Elders in Monster Hunter 4 strike the balance between returning and new Elders, creating a good blend of new and updated fights to this entry in the Monster Hunter series. A relative of the giant Gen Moran, Daran Moran is a massive elder dragon that is adorned with a singular horn, differing to the two tusks found on Gen Moran. Daran Moran was introduced in Monster Hunter 4 and is fought in the Great Desert, much like the other two Morans. Daran stands at a respectable 11,446.5 centimeters, 
making it slightly larger than Jen. It is weakest to the thunder and dragon elements. Diron Moran's description reads, Colossal elder dragons that swim through the great desert, smashing obstacles with their spiral horns. The unique color comes from the thick layer of oxidized metals and other rare minerals that lodge in their hides over their long lives. Darren Moran's theme is shared with Jem Moran from Phase 1 and Phase 2. Surprisingly, in a first for the series, Darren Moran is the very first monster the player encounters and sets off the story of Monster Hunter 4 and 4 Ultimate. The player is on a sand ship in the great desert with the Caravanir. From here, the player encounters Darren Moran and needs to fight it after the Caravanir's hat is blown by the wind onto Darren's back. The player is tasked with retrieving the hat and once it is retrieved, a shorter fight with Darren Moran will take place. At some point, the hunter will need to use the hunting gong on the ship. The fight will then end, and a cutscene of Darren Moran threatening to ram the town of Al Habar will play, with it turning away at the last second. Darren Moran is encountered right at the beginning of Monster Hunter 4 and 4 Ultimate. It really sets an impression of what the rest of 4 Ultimate holds. Darren Moran's fight differs quite a bit from the Gen Moran fight while still being similar enough. Phase 1 involves Darren Moran pursuing the ship. At the start of the quest, the player will spawn in the ship and will once again have access to all the ballistae, cannons, one-shot binders, and is able to use the hunting gong. You can climb onto Darren Moran's back several times during the fight. The layout of Darren Moran's back is different to Jen Moran's, as there are two separate areas on Darren Moran's back, separated by a crest. The first time the player climbs on the back, you want to target the fin and break it. The only way to get past the crest on Dara Moran's body is by either climbing on its hands to the top of its head during phase 2, or climbing from the front of Dara Moran and breaking the head crest, which is possible to do after it rams the ship. The player can then break Dara Moran's blowhole twice, which will stop it from shooting spikes onto different parts of the ship. Darren Moran has three breakable parts on its back. Its back fin, its head crest, and its blowhole. Darren will jump over the ship when going from the right side to the left side, with a cutscene to accompany it. Once Darren Moran is on the right side of the ship, the pattern of attack is very similar. Just use the ballista, one-shot binders, cannons, and hunting gong to deal damage and ward off Darren Moran. After Darren has been on the right and left sides of the ship, it will go to the front and try to ram the ship in a similar manner to Jen Moran. Like in the Jen fight, the player should try to activate the Dragon Eater when Darren Moran gets too close to the ship. However, Darren Moran's ramming of the ship is a bit slower and I am personally used to timing the Dragon Eater for Jen rather than Darren, so I find timing the Dragon Eater a bit more difficult. Another thing to note in Phase 1 is that when Darren Moran rams the ship, the player will be forced to brace in order to not slide onto the sand and fall off the ship. Phase 2 starts out the same as in the Gen fight, with Darren Moran spawning on the other side of the area. However, in G rank, Darren Moran will spawn close to the ship at the start of Phase 2. The player can now directly attack Darren Moran. A good strategy to break the blowhole if it hasn't already been broken is to break the arms of Darren. As if the player deals enough damage, Darren will fall over and the player can climb up to its head via its arms and break the blowhole. Some things to watch out for in Phase 2 are making sure that Darren isn't pushed back out of the area during the fight, as in low rank and high rank it spawns very far away from the boat. Once again, when the Dragon Eater is used, Proof of a Hero will play. However, instead of being the 3rd gem rendition of Proof of a Hero, this is the 4th gem rendition of Proof of a Hero. Apart from that, Phase 2 is quite similar to Jen Moran's Phase 2, with the battlements and dragon eater present in order to assist the hunter. Darren's horn can be broken, both legs, its blowhole twice, its fin located on its back, and a crest located on its head. During the fight in both Phase 1 and 2, materials can be mined off of Darren Moran's back, with mining spots appearing on its back. And similarly to Jen Moran, if you time a hunting gong perfectly, Darren will roll onto its side, and you can carve directly out of its mouth, netting the player an additional 2 carves on top of the 8 carves the player gets from the Darren Moran after it dies.
Shigaru Megala is the final boss of Monsanto 4 Village and Monsanto 4 Ultimate's low ranked village. It is the evolved form of the monster Gore Megala, a monster that the story of Monsanto 4 revolves around quite heavily. This is because Gore and Shigaru Megala spread a virus called the Frenzy Virus, which is another key aspect of the story. Shigaru Megala is fought in the Sanctuary, which is also the original outbreak spot of the Frenzy Virus. Shigaru ranges between sizes of 1,564.73 cm and 2,187.6 cm. In the story of Monsanto 4, Shigaru Megala plays a key role. First is Gore Megala when it attacks the caravan when they are sailing on the ocean in their ship, Arluk. Then once again when they need to rescue the ace hunters from the same Gore Megala. Then again when the Tanta is tasked with hunting the Gore Megala by the guild. After all of this, the Gormagala flees, and molts, turning from a Gormagala into a Shigaru Megala. From here, the hunter can hunt the Shigaru Megala in an epic showdown in the sanctuary. Instead of the dark black and purple of Gormagala, Shigaru is covered in a golden coat of scales, and shares the same body structure as Gormagala, six limbs, horns, and a tail. Shigaru's description reads, the distinctive radiant light of the mature Gore Megala has been seen in the Sanctuary of Heaven's Mount. Some believe Shigaru Megala was the foul winds that withered a mountain, the calamity spoken of in ancient texts. Shigaru Megala can inflict the Frenzy Virus. Once the hunter is affected, there are two possible outcomes, either resulting in a buff or a debuff. There is a bar that fills up once the hunter is afflicted by the status. If it fills, the player gets the debuff, no natural health recovery, and extra damage from all Frenzy Virus imbued attacks. However, the bar can be reduced via a Null Berry, but not removed. It can only be removed if the player deals enough damage to the monster, resulting in a buff of an extra 15% affinity and immunity to the Frenzy Virus for a period of time. Shigaru spreads the Frenzy Virus for a number of reasons, including claiming territory, stopping rival Gormagalas from molting, thus turning to Shigaru Megalas and allowing the next generation of Gore Megalas to spawn. The virus affects any monsters that it comes into contact with, making them significantly more dangerous and aggressive. Shigaru Megala appears almost as a deity-like monster, having the motive of a wheel attached to the names of its quests and its other English title being Heaven's Wheel. Shigaru Megala is also tied to the concept of Samsara, the cycle of birth, death and rebirth in an endless loop. Furthermore, right before the player hunts Shigaru Megala for the first time in Cathar, the Grand Guru gives the player a song called the Cathar Song. Its lyrics are as follows. This idea of Samsara being connected to Shigaru Megala is reinforced by the life cycle of Gore Megala and Shigaru Megala. It's once Shigaru Megala dies, there is always a Gore Megala to take its place in an endless cycle. Shigaru Megala is always reincarnated when another Gore Megala takes its place in the ecosystem. I won't get any more into it right now as some of that is speculation, but the Samsara motive is very cool, especially to have it attached to a monster like Shigaru. Once a player finally managed to kill Shigaru Megala in Low Rank Village, the credits will roll shortly after. Shigaru's fight is a spectacle. The first time you fight it, it is a culminating moment within the story. Shigaru's attack patterns are interesting, as in its base unenraged state, it uses the same attacks as an enraged Gore Megala. Shigaru can be flash bombed out of the air as it has functional eyes, unlike Gore, which doesn't. When the player first enters the sanctuary, there will be a few things in the area, including ledges and a giant rock in the center of the map. The hunter can use the rock for cover, however it will break throughout the course of the fight. During the fight, when Shigaru is enraged, it will fly into the air and roar, causing explosions and getting even angrier than before. Shigaru's moveset is pretty much just Skull Megala's moveset, plus a few extra moves. A couple of these extra moves are shooting balls of frenzy towards the hunter that create explosions and deal large amounts of damage and slamming the ground more with its wing arms. As previously mentioned, Shigaru is fought in the sanctuary, but due to its presence, it causes the background of the sanctuary to be a pitch black. A few other things to mention about the fight is that Shigaru's roar requires high-grade earplugs to block, and Shigaru has a few breakable parts. 
both its horns, its wing arms, its wings, and its tail. Finally, I also wanted to briefly mention the Shigaru theme. It fits the fight so well, and really communicates the message of the fight being a final showdown between Shigaru and the Hunter, a fight to the death. This behemoth of a monster is the largest monster in the mainline Monster Hunter franchise, Dalamadur. It stands at 44,039.7 centimeters, or over 440 meters. Dalamadur is found in a location unique to its fight, Spiritic Crag, an area found in the mountains above Heaven's Mount. Visually, Dalamadur has a serpent-like body, and its hide has a bluish hue with red eyes and spikes lining its back all the way down to its tail. Its description reads, A huge elder dragon, massive beyond human comprehension. The only mention of its existence is found in fairy tales, which claim it can warp the very surface of the world and level mountains with a single twitch. Dalamadur is a very aggressive monster and is weakest to the dragon element. A dead Dalamadur's body makes up a chunk of the rotten veil in Monsanto world, which is a cool little detail. Dalamadur's chest and face can glow during the hunt, with its chest venting steam that damages the players in a similar manner to Tiostra's flame aura. Its tail can make a sound just like a rattlesnake's, and its tongue can paralyze players if they stand too close to the head. The weak spots on Dalamadur's body include its broken head, its tail tip, and back legs. One other thing to note, is that in-game, Dalamador has two separate icons on the minimap. They represent its head and its tail, so keep that a note of that when locking onto Dalamador in-game. Dalamador is the final boss of the online hub of Monster Hunter 4 and 4 Ultimate. It is placed right before G-Rank, meaning it is the final test before the trials and tribulations of the Elder Hall, the place where all G-Rank quests take place. Personally, I found Dalamador to be very enjoyable especially from my first couple of hunts. It seems to be more of a spectacle than a hunt at times. The fight is separated into two phases. I personally didn't notice a whole lot of change between phase one and phase two, mostly just the music changing and its attacks ramping up in intensity. At the beginning of the fight, a cutscene will play, with the hunter walking around spear tip crag. Dalamador emerges nearby, it then encircles the spire in the middle of the map showcasing what a colossal undertaking this is for the hunter. They are tasked with killing the largest monster in the series. Some strategies for the fight would be to climb Dalamador when you are given the chance, as the player can attack different parts of Dalamador's body, including its hand, its head, and its back. The interesting thing about the fight is that you already start in the main area, so you have to cart, jump off the map, or farcaster in order to access the base camp. In the camp, there are supplies such as anti-dragon bombs, barrel bombs, alongside the essentials like rations and potions. When climbing Dalamador, there are two different routes. Either the player can run up all the way to Dalamador's back and try to break the back, or they can climb the spire and either attack the arm or jump on the head to get a couple carbs. Dalamador has a whole host of unique moves. These include summoning meteors that track players, a giant sweeping fire beam that covers the entire area, shooting fireballs at players, and using its tail to attack the players. It can also do a biting move, where it tries to bite the player. However, its face gets snagged on the edge of the area, giving hunters time to react. The flame floor or laser move that Dalamodo does can be deadly. The best way to avoid this beam is by Superman diving out of the way. However, sometimes the hunter will need to react quickly to the fire beam, as Dalamodo can do it twice in succession. Dalamador does this by doing the first beam and then quickly moving to the other side of the area to fire a second beam, catching hunters off guard. At a certain point in the fight, Dalamador will break half the map, which once again shows how imposing and large Dalamador is compared to the hunter. Dalamador's head can be broken twice, its back twice, each claw once, its chest twice, and its tail cut. 
It also comes as no surprise that Dalamadur's roar requires high grade earplugs. I really like Dalamadur's theme. It aids in creating the exciting and intense atmosphere of the fight. I found the fight is most enjoyable the first few hunts, as the mechanics and sequence of the hunt is brand new. After that, it does get a bit repetitive. Overall, I do enjoy the Dalamadur fight, both from the perspective of it as a spectacle and a hunt. Roshi Kirin is a subspecies of the regular Kirin and ranges in sizes between 483.82 cm and 989.64 cm. Rather than using the lightning Kirin is so well known for, Roshi Kirin uses ice instead and is able to utilize ice shards in its attacks. There are only two places where Roshi Kirin can be encountered, the Tower Summit or the Everwood. The only part of Roshi Kirin's body that can be broken is its horn. Its description is as follows. Reliable sightings of these elusive creatures are virtually non-existent. The few reports available claim that temperatures plummet whenever they appear, as all the moisture in the air spontaneously freezes. Visually, Hiroshi Kirin is distinct, as its body is a darker blue, and it has dark black hair alongside a horn that is pink. Surprisingly, despite only appearing in Monsanto 4 and 4 Ultimate, Roshi Kirin has appeared in both Monster Hunter Stories 1 and Stories 2. Roshi Kirin's fight is honestly easier than regular Kirin's fight. The ice that it summons is a lot easier to dodge. I found that it was more telegraphed. Roshi Kirin's arsenal also seems to be smaller than regular Kirin's. All it really does is charge around the area and summon ice crystals. When enraged, Roshi Kirin's skin becomes difficult to cut through, so it's best to use Mind's Eye in order to deal with Roshi Kirin. Roshi Kirin is weakest to fire and water, with the horn being the best place to attack on the body. Another great thing about Roshi Kirin's fight is that you don't need to deal with Thunder Blight or Paralysis, which is the thing I found most annoying about the regular Kirin. Despite Thunder Blight and Paralysis not being a worry, Roshi Kirin's icicles and ice spikes still cause ice blight if the player touches them or interacts with them. If Kirin returns in a future Monster Hunter game, I'd also like Roshi Kirin to return as even though Roshi Kirin is easier than regular Kirin, I find it complements the Kirin fight in a nice way, being the easier counterpart to Kirin. In other words, Roshi is just a better Kirin. All the elders that are in Monster Hunter 4 are from Generation 1 or Generation 2. The returning elders are Fatalis, Kirin, Crimson Fatalis, Kushala Deora, and Teostra. Honestly, it's a pretty good mix of Elder Dragons to boost up the roster of Monster Hunter 4. As most of the elders have been previously covered, I'll mostly recap any changes the elders experienced from the transition from Gen 1 or 2 to Gen 4. However, I'm going to mention a few things that I've previously talked about in the earlier videos within this series, such as monster sizes, the elements of each monster, and relevant ecological information on each Elder Dragon. Fatalis is the first dangerous class monster introduced in the Monster Hunter series. It first appeared in the very first Monster Hunter game as the final online boss for Monster Hunter 1. For Fatalis' return in 4th gen, it got a lot of upgrades from the first and second generations. Visually, Fatalis remained the same, with 6 limbs, a tail, wing arms, and is the exact same size, at 4110.6cm. It can now inflict Fire Blight and Dragon Blight but still uses the same two elements, fire and dragon. 
As I previously mentioned, Vitalis mostly resembles a traditional dragon in its design. And lore-wise, long story short, Vitalis is a monster that is extremely intelligent and possesses a hatred for all of humanity. Vitalis' description in Monster Hunter 4 and 4 Ultimate is Stories of this legendary dragon date back to antiquity. Many skilled hunters have sought to challenge it, but none have ever returned. A monster shrouded in mystery. The unlock conditions for Fatalis in Monster Hunter 4 and 4 Ultimate are simple. Fatalis is unlocked at Hunter Rank 70 and can be fought in High Rank Hub. Fatalis' head can be broken twice, each wing once, and its chest once. Fatalis' fight was cleaned up and refined a lot in Monster Hunter 4, with many things being changed within the fight. At the start of the hunt, a cutscene will play, showing the hunter walking around Castle Shrade. Fatalis then reveals itself and roars. It's different enough to the Gem 1 Fatalis introduction to feel exciting. And it can be skipped, which is a huge bonus. Like in Gem 1 and Gen 2, Fatalis has fought in Castle Shrade. However, Castle Shrade has had an upgrade, with the Dragonator, Ballistae, and Cannons being moved into a central arena, rather than being spread out over the older version of Castle Shrade. The camp was also changed for Castle Shrade, and the item box contained some max potions, which I found useful during the fight. There are a few changes made to Fatalis' arsenal of moves. Fatalis gained a flamethrower attack that it can use covering a large area. It is similar in a way to Teostra and Lunastra's flamethrower from Gen 2. Fatalis' snap and drag attack was slightly changed. It deals significant damage from the front, however from the sides and back it will simply knock the player back and deal less damage. Fatalis can also release powder that ignites near players and causes fire blight. The last new attack was a sweeping bite that inflicts dragon blight if the hunters get hit. Most other attacks that Fatalis has remain the same. Its claw swipe, transition from standing on two legs to going on four legs, its tail swipe, and its fireball shots towards the hunter remains the same. During the hunt, the player should make use of the available battlements at Castle Shrade, including a Dragonator, One-Shot Binders, Cannons, and Ballista. The Dragonator in particular is pretty useful, as whenever Fatalis is hit by the Dragonator, its head will go onto the ground, creating a really good opportunity to deal damage to the head. Fatalis can also be mounted during the fight, but Fatalis will move around a lot. The hunter needs to be on their A game if they want to finish the mount successfully. Personally, I found this version of Fatalis enjoyable. It's a nice refreshing take on Fatalis, with an updated moveset to reflect where the series was at in regards to how it handled returning monsters. They also managed to clean up Fatalis' hitboxes. This version of Fatalis resembles Monster Hunter World's Fatalis a lot more. I also found it was easier to fight if you're coming from a game in the series like World or Rise. Fatalis does reposition a lot during the fight, which makes getting close to it a pain, especially with Greatsword. As the, if the monster even slightly moves, it can mess up the alignment of an attack. Kirin is an Elder Dragon, also known as the Phantom Beast. It is the smallest large monster in all of Monster Hunter, and by extension, the smallest Elder Dragon. As I previously mentioned, Kirin uses the Thunder Element and the Paralysis Ailment, which makes it a real pain in the ass to fight. Kirin ranges in sizes from 371.4cm to 989.64cm. Visually, Kirin is most similar to a unicorn with crimson eyes, a blue hide, and a white mane. Kirin usually refrains from physical attacks, mostly using ranged attacks consisting of lightning strikes. In Monster Hunter 4 and 4 Ultimate, its description reads, Elder dragons so rarely sighted that little is known of their ecology, though everyone knows of the high prices Kirin parts fetch. It's been said they are one with lightning itself, and that their bodies become clothed in pure electricity when they are provoked. Within Monster Hunter 4 and 4 Ultimate, only Kirin's horn can be broken, 
and it has fought in the Everwood. Kieran's fight is still annoying as it is in Gen 1 and Gen 2. However, I found that as the movement is better in Gen 4, dealing with Kieran is not as much of a hassle due to the player's improved mobility and aerial attacks. That being said, Kieran's abilities still make the fight painful, as it has now gained the ability to afflict Thunderblight with its attacks on top of the paralysis. There are a few changes with Kieran's fight, such as the player now being able to get in 3 cards instead of 2 in previous games. Kieran gains a few new attacks, a backwards kick, it can cause a large electrical explosion, and it can do multiple horn thrusts in succession, which adds to the fight in a positive way, as Gen 1 and Gen 2 Kieran's moveset can be a little bit frustrating and stale. During the fight, the theme that plays is the tower theme, making it a bit odd, as Kieran doesn't have a dedicated theme, but rather borrows a theme from a different map. Kieran is still quite susceptible to sleep and blast, making them good options to use in the fight. Mind's Eye is also a must during the fight, as when enraged, Kieran's hide is difficult to cut through, much like Oroshi Kieran's. Overall, Kieran's fight in Gen 4 didn't change a whole lot from Gen 1 and Gen 2. It's one of the fights that really didn't see a massive revamp compared to other Gen 1 Elder Dragons, like Fatalis. Crimson Fatalis is a dangerous first class monster, introduced in Monster Hunter G. It stands at 4110.6 cm. Appearance wise, it is similar to the regular Fatalis, with two main differences. It has an enlarged horn, and its hide is no longer black, but is rather a reddish orange, covering its entire body. The reason its hide is this coloration is because of the exposure Crimson Fatalis has had to the volcano turning its black scales red. It's fought in Ingle Isle, an area introduced in Monster Hunter 4, which is where the player also hunts a Cantor and Raging Bracky. Ingle Isle is an area much like the Sacred Land, in that it is an area that requires players to bring cool drinks or the heat resist skill. The interesting thing about this area is that the area can change elevation during the fight, meaning certain sections of the ground can be raised or lowered during the fight. In Monster Hunter 4, Crimson Fatalis gains the ability to inflict Blast Blight, as well as Fire Blight. The elements that it uses during the fight still remain the same, as in 1st and 2nd Gen, Dragon and Fire. Crimson Fatalis' head can be broken twice, its chest once, and its wings once. It can be fought in Village and Hub in Monster Hunter 4 and 4 Ultimate. In Monster Hunter 4, Crimson Fatalis is fought in a high rank event quest called Enter the Red Dragon whereas in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, it can be fought in High Rank Village and G Rank. Crimson Fatalis is unlocked in High Rank Village by doing a series of egg quests. Needless to say, I found these egg quests extremely frustrating. This is coming from someone who has done the Monster Hunter Freedom Powder Stone quest. Because after you grab the egg, the map changes, ensuring that you have to take a longer route in order to complete the quest and unlock Crimson Fatalis. Before 4 Ultimate egg quests, I didn't actually mind doing egg quests, now I have nothing but hatred for egg quests. This version of Crimson Vitalis is different to the G rank version, as it is considerably easier. Super Crimson Vitalis is a super powerful version of Vitalis that is fought at the end of G rank. It is unlocked after the hunter deciphers the age texts that are given by his immenseness in the Elder Hall within Dundorma. The age texts are a series of texts that are covered in glyphs that must be decoded by the hunter. There are 11 texts in total. Every end game or difficult monster the hunter fights deciphers part of an age text. Some monsters give more glyphs than others. Every age texts take longer and longer to decipher, as there are more and more lines that the hunter must decode. Once an age text is completed, a new monster is able to be fought in G rank within 4 Ultimates G rank hub. The unlocked monsters are Molten Tigrex, Acanto, Apex Seregios, Chaotic Gormagala, Shah Dalamadur, Apex Rajang, 
Raging Brachy, Eucanlos, Gogmazios, Crimson Vitalis, and a final quest with five monsters called Monster Hunter. G rank Crimson Vitalis has a couple other defining features to the fight. It has a different theme compared with the regular Crimson Vitalis, a new intro cutscene, and has a whole host of new attacks. Crimson Vitalis has a few changes from Gen 1 and Gen 2 to Gen 4. It no longer has an armor mode, so when it gets enraged its skin does heat up, but the hunter's weapons will no longer bounce off the monster. I'm going to break down the review of the fight into the regular Crimson Vitalis and then the Super Crimson Vitalis that is fought at the end of G rank. At the start of the village high rank Crimson Vitalis, a cutscene will play, showcasing the player walking around Ingle Isle, encountering Crimson Vitalis. From here, Crimson Vitalis flies, shooting meteors at the hunter and surprising the player. At the end of the cutscene, Crimson Vitalis will once again use its dive bomb attack, jump scaring hunters so you will need to react quickly in order to not get hit by its attack. This intro is also a callback to its original introduction cutscene in Monsanto G. Village Crimson Vitalis' fight will then start. Its head is a great spot to focus on during the fight, but unfortunately, as I am a greatsword main, getting close to Crimson Vitalis' head is suicide. So what I found to work was attacking the legs and staggering Crimson Vitalis but I'd also attack the head and arms when given the opportunity. Crimson Fatalis will also change the elevation of the area throughout the fight. It has a range of attacks, including a fire flamethrower that Black Fatalis can do, swipes with its claws and tail that inflict blast blight, it has a short ranged blast explosion, the snap and drag, and it can summon meteors. G rank Crimson Fatalis is the significantly more difficult version of the village Crimson Fatalis, it gets its own intro cutscene, where it's shown sleeping, bathed in lava. It wakes, summoning a heat wave, heating up the air around it. From here, Crimson Fatalis roars and summons fireballs to attack the hunter. The fight strategy for this version of Crimson Fatalis remains the same. Just take your opportunities to attack when they come, and be careful of the high damage Crimson Fatalis can deal. G rank Crimson Fatalis has a bunch of new moves including a heat wave that it can use, draining the health of hunters. It does this by flapping its wings, which can briefly stun hunters. Crimson Fatalis can also summon lava geysers that erupt around the area, and its legs are so hot they can burn the player. They merely walk near the hunter. Overall, I find Crimson Fatalis and Monster Hunter 4 and 4 Ultimate interesting, purely because of the existence of g rank for Crimson Fatalis. This super powered up version of Crimson Fatty presents a real challenge and changes up the moveset and appearance of the monster in a unique way. Kushala Deora's iteration in the 4th generation is quite a refreshed take on Kushala, as Monster Hunter 4 is the 2nd generation Kushala appears in, it skipped 3rd gen. It ranges between sizes of 1261.6cm to 2391.41cm. It's weakest to the dragon and thunder elements. Kushala is a dragon lined with metallic skin that it sheds from time to time, especially when it starts to rust. Kushala that fail to molt their skin turn into rusted Kushala Deora. Kushala Deora can be fought in several locations within 4 and 4 Ultimate. They are the Tower Summit, the Frozen Seaway, the Everwood, Dunes, and Battle Quarters. Kushala Deora is an Elder Dragon in a trio with two other Elder Dragons, Teostra and Camellios. They act as a rock, paper, scissors. Camellios gear is best for taking down Kushala. Kushala gear is best fit for Teostra, and Teostra gear is best against Camellios. That being said, I do find it weird that Capcom has left Camellios out of the trio on two separate occasions in the series, as it was left out in Monsanto 4 and Monsanto World, despite Teostra and Kushala appearing. 
The in-game description for Kushala de Aura is as follows. It's difficult to even get close to one of these metallic dragons, but some claim better odds if the creature is weakened with poison or has another hunter on its back, limiting the amount of wind pressure it can muster. In Monster Hunter 4 and 4 Ultimate, its head and wings can be broken and its tail severed. The Kushala fight was changed quite a bit. These changes include how the player interacts with Kushala. I found that I needed to be more careful as Kushala has more AoE tornadoes that cover a larger area. I would sometimes mindlessly walk into a tornado, or I wouldn't keep track of where Kushala's tornadoes were on the map. In G rank especially, Kushala really ramps up the intensity of the fight, sending out barrages of small mini tornadoes that zoom across the map and deal a lot of damage. Kushala has a wide moveset, consisting of summoning tornadoes, back hops, claw swipes, roars, and charges. Kushala's wind barrier works a bit different in 4th gen. It has a black wind barrier and a white wind barrier. Kushala in an enraged state will create the white wind barrier, which causes high wind pressure. Kushala's black wind barrier occurs when it's in an enraged state. It's a more powerful type of wind called dragon wind. The black barrier can be disabled by poison in Kushala, turning the barrier from black to white. The tactics I mentioned in the second gen video for taking down Kushala still apply here. Poison works well at mitigating the wind barrier alongside bringing flash bombs and targeting Kushala's head and tail. As if the hunter manages to break the tail or head, Kushala will only be able to use the white wind barrier. Teostra in Monsanto 4 is an imposing fight. I consider it one of the most challenging iterations of Teostra, especially the high rank version. Teostra's sizes range between 1,479.0 cm to 2,610.0 cm, and physically, it mostly resembles a lion. Its description in 4 and 4 Ultimate reads, Brutal elder dragons clothed in flame that spit blazing fire. Teostra are of such a fierce and deadly nature that the guild keeps track of their movements whenever possible. In 4th gen, Teostra is now able to inflict Fire Blight, Blast Blight, and Stun, and still uses the Fire Element. In 4 and 4 Ultimate, Teostra can be fought in the Volcanic Hollow, Everwood, Ingle Isle, Dunes, and Battle Quarters. Teostra's wings and horn can be broken and its tail severed. There isn't a whole lot else to say about Teostra's behaviour or physiology that I haven't already said before. Teostra's fight is still one of my favourites in the series. Enduring is a staple of what a good Elder Dragon fight looks like. I found that in high rank, Teostra is very annoying. It constantly spams charges, catching the player off guard. However, in G rank, Teostra is a much better fight. It's because it has a wider array of moves in its move pool, it charges less making the fight all the more bearable. Teostra's fight went through a lot of changes from Monsanto Freedom Unite to Monsanto 4 and 4 Ultimate. These changes include Dragon Element no longer being necessary in order to break its horns, and Teostra's Flame Aura no longer being active when he's enraged. However, whenever the Flame Aura is active, Teostra's Flamethrower is longer and will last for a longer amount of time. Teostra also has Dragon Wind that it will activate whilst the Flame Aura is active. There are a few ways the player can remove Teostra's Flame Aura. It can be removed by either flinching or poisoning Teostra. In G rank, Enraged Teostra has a few specific new attacks, including releasing powder with its backwards hop, detonating the powder by either hopping backwards or through a claw swipe, and Teostra can do a ranged explosion. Additionally, its claw swipes and tail whips can also release blast powder when it is enraged. These moves will not release any powder when Teostra is not enraged. Roughly 100 seconds after Teostra is enraged, it will do a massive supernova attack, where it flies up into the air and releases a massive explosion. This explosion will deal fire damage and will inflict stun. Once the supernova is over, 
Tiosha will return back to the unenraged state. Tiosha's rage can be stopped in a variety of ways, by mounting him, cutting his tail, paralyzing him, and putting him to sleep, KOing him, knocking over Tiosha, or dealing enough damage to the head. Tiosha only requires earplugs, not high grade earplugs, to block its roars. Overall, Tiosha in 4 and 4 Ultimate is a pretty interesting fight. It's a decently challenging fight, however, there are a lot of ways to mitigate the challenge and deal with Tiosha in an effective way. Monsanto 4 Ultimate is a continuation of Monsanto 4, and is the G-Rank expansion of Monsanto 4. It adds a whole new host of monsters, including two new Elder Dragons, and three new returning Elder Dragons from Generation 2. As a whole, I really like 4 Ultimate's roster. It is one of the strongest in the entire Monsanto series. These new Elder Dragons really enforce this sentiment in my opinion. The new Elder Dragons especially, with one of them being the final online boss, and one of my favourite fights in the series. Monsanto 4 Ultimate stands tall, with 14 Elder Dragons in total, having the most of any game in the series up until this point. A subspecies of Dalamadur, Shah Dalamadur is still the largest monster in the mainline Monsanto games, standing at 44,039.7 cm. Once again, Shah Dalamadur is fought at Spear Tip Crag and can induce paralysis. The elements it is weakest to include Dragon, Thunder, and Ice. Shah Dalamadur is simply a Dalamadur that has shed its skin with a whitish hide and orange spikes that line its entire body. One other difference from the regular Delamador is that the spikes lining its head are slightly larger. Its in-game description reads, a Delamador subspecies easily identified by the red spines lining its back. Though they were once thought to exist only in legend, multiple sightings in the past few years have led many to fear Shah Delamador as an omen of grave things to come. In Monsanto 4 Ultimate, Shah Dalamadur has many breakable parts. Several parts can be broken twice, like the head, chest, back, and tail. However, each claw can only be broken once. Shah Dalamadur is more aggressive than Dalamadur due to the fact it has just shed its skin, meaning it is in a more vulnerable state. The introduction cutscene for Shah Dalamadur's fight goes so hard. It is one of my favorite cutscenes in the series. It starts off with the hunter climbing onto spear tip crag. From here, Shah Dalamadur is shown waking up and ascending to the top of the spear tip in order to attack the player, with the hunter just narrowly avoiding being swallowed by Shah Dalamadur. From here, the hunter faces up to Shah and Shah roars. Unlike Dalamadur, Shah Dalamadur will not start the fight wrapped around the center of the spire, but rather on the edge of the map. Shah has a few added abilities to its moveset. It can now set the ground on fire when it does claw attacks and biting attacks, meaning the player needs to be careful during the fight so they don't take damage from the ground. It is important to note that Shah Delamadur's hide is tougher than regular Delamadur's hide. And even with purple sharpness, players will bounce off. The best way to offset this is by bringing Mind's Eye. Strategies for Shah Delamadur's fight are the same as Delamadur's. However, you should be more mindful of the fire beam that Shah Delamador is able to produce as they deal a lot of damage. Anytime I was hit with a fire beam, it one shot me. Other tidbits of advice for the fight include climbing Shah Delamador's back whenever presented with the opportunity and either attacking the back or head, watching out for the meteors as they track players, 
and being conscious of where Shard Dalamadur is positioned on the map in order to ensure the best openings for damage. Shard Dalamadur shares its theme with Dalamadur for both Phase 1 and Phase 2. I personally like Shard's fight, just slightly more than Dalamadur's, mainly because I like Shard Dalla's design more and its fight is more of a challenge. The final boss of Monsanto 4 Ultimate's G-Rank Hub, Gogmazios physically looks most similar to Gormagala or Shigaru Megala, and is covered in a tar-like substance. Whenever Gogmazios starts to heat up its throat, it looks like it has a second face. Gogmazios has a similar diet to Teostra, eating sulfur and gum powder. This is partly the reason the hunter encounters Gogmazios in the first place, as Gogmazios raids armories in order to access sulfur and gunpowder. Dundorma, the city the hunter resides in, is a large city in the world of Monster Hunter, with many armories and warehouses, thus making it a prime target for Gogmazius. Gogmazius is fought in the battle quarters, and is 4920.5 centimeters. It uses the fire element, and can inflict fire blight, as well as it's a unique status to the fight, the Tard status which envelops the hunter, causing them to be stuck in place. The tard status can be removed by using a cleanser. The in-game description for Gogmazios is, coated in a thick, sticky liquid, this massive elder dragon appears unkindered by the dragonator lodged in its back. Eyewitnesses reports suggest that, despite its massive size, this mysterious behemoth is indeed capable of flight. Gogmazios' head can be broken once, its back twice, its chest once, wing claws once each, and its tail can be cut. If its back is broken twice, it dislodges a Dragonator that can then be activated and deal damage to Gogmazios. Gogmazios' intro presents a scene with Gog walking around the battle quarters. The hunter then jumps onto the ground and faces the behemoth they are going to be taking down. After the cutscene ends, the hunter is thrust straight into the thick of the battle, with no time to repair at the camp. As Gogmazius is fought in the battle quarters, there are several battlements at the hunter's disposal, including a Dragonator, a Cannon on Rayords, Ballista and the Demolisher, which I will explain later, so make sure to use the battlements to their fullest extent. The strategy for the first phase of the fight is just to attack Gogmazius getting in any opportunities for damage when possible, as Gog has a large HP pool. Phase 1 remains relatively simple apart from that. Gogmazius has a series of attacks in the first phase, including spreading tar as it drips off its body, roaring, blasting tar in a horizontal line across the area, charging forwards, body slams, swipes with its wing arms that go across the area, and it can fire a concentrated fire beam, that explodes in a large radius. Once enough damage has been dealt to Gog, it will enter the second phase of the fight, where it roars and then the music changes, signifying the beginning of phase 2. The first time I saw Gogmazius enter the second phase of the fight is one of the few moments in Monster Hunter where I have been genuinely shocked. Gogmazius leaps into the air, firing laser after laser. It's the last monster I would think capable of flight and here it is, flying firing beam after beam. When Gogmazius is flying, there are several ways to get it out of the sky. These include using the restraints around the battle quarters, which bind to Gogmazius pulling it to the ground. Another option is using the Demolisher, which is powered by Dense Markhol, an item that the player must unlock via a series of quests. Before the hunter can use the Demolisher, they will need to move the cart on rails located on the southern side of the area to the northern part of Area 3. The Demolisher deals a large amount of damage and will knock Gog down if it successfully connects. Gogmazius' chest and back can be mounted, depending on whether it is standing up or if it's on all fours. Gogmazius' attacks in the second phase are a lot more fast paced than the first phase. 
It's, it's attacks ramp up in intensity. And they include flying in the air and doing the fire beam from phase one, dripping tar from its body that explodes on impacts to the ground in a similar way Bracky slime explodes, and a fire beam that encircles the entire area. As the final boss of the G rank hub, I think Gogmazius does a fantastic job of being a unique, engaging, and creative final fight before the rest of G rank is unlocked. My only gripe with the fight is Gog's massive HP pool, meaning that soloing Gog is quite the ordeal, requiring the player to be very prepared for the fight or else face timing out and failing the quest. There were three new returning elders in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. They are Camellios, Rosta Kushala Deora, and White Fatalis. Even though these elders were introduced in a G rank expansion, a lot of them have high rank versions, thanks to High Rank Village. These three elders add to 4 Ultimate in a satisfying way, as with the addition of Camellios, it caps off the Elder Dragon trio of Kushala, Teosha, and Camellios, and the addition of White Fatalis caps off the Fatalis trio. Camellios is an elusive Elder Dragon that makes its return in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. It ranges in sizes from 1,395.2 cm to 2,811.32 cm. Camellios, like most other returning Elder Dragons, went through a variety of changes from its Gen 2 iteration that I'll cover later. Camellios can only use poison in Gen 4, and is weakest to the dragon element and fire element on its head. Camellios is encountered in the Ancestral Steppe, Primal Forest, Everwood, and Battle Quarters in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. The in-game description for Camellios is, Precious few sightings of this Elder Dragon have been recorded leading to claims it can vanish into its environment like a chameleon, hence its name. Witnesses report attacks can come out of nowhere, but that smoke bombs will keep the beast visible. Camellios' horn can be broken, its wings broken, and its tail severed. In Monster Hunter 4, Camellios' parts can be traded at the Wiporium in exchange for Kushala Deora materials. This ensured that in base Monster Hunter 4, players could get high rank of Camellios' parts. Camellios' fight is still challenging in 4 Ultimate, as it is only fightable in High Rank Village and G Rank. Camellios has lost the ability to do several things in its transition from 2nd Gen to 4th Gen. It is no longer able to inflict fatigue, defense down, or vocal cord paralysis, and no longer has access to the dragon element. Whenever Camellios is enraged, it will now cover the entire area in fog, and it can only go invisible once the fog is present. Some other changes to the fight include, Camellios' battle theme now playing the entire duration of the fight, not just when it is enraged. Camellios' battle theme will now also be muffled when it covers the area in fog. Camellios' poison spit now leaves clouds behind, of which Camellios is able to manipulate using wind pressure from its wings. Camellios' poison now has a much shorter duration, as poison inflicted via spit and poison clouds only lasts anywhere from 10 to 15 seconds. Poison induced by poison breath attacks only last anywhere from 3 to 5 seconds. Just like Teostra, the hunter no longer needs to use the dragon element to break Camellios' horn. Once again, the strategies that were useful for the fight in 2nd gen apply here. Flash bombing, smoke bombing, poisoning, and sonic bombing Camellios are all good ways to make it visible or locate it during the fight. 4 Ultimate is a fitting game to have Camellios in as it finally rejoins Kushala and Teostra in the Elder Dragon Trio.
Rasukushala Deora does not have a description in Monsanto 4 Ultimate. However, it does now get its own calves, items, and armor, which is welcome. Rasukushala can be fought in the Battle Quarters and the Polar Field. Its sizes range between 1,261.6 cm and 2,129 cm. Rasukushala no longer uses the Dragon Element and only has access to the Ice Element, which means it can inflict Ice Blight. Rasukushala is the final boss of Monsanto 4 Ultimate's village and is teased several times throughout Hiring Village. It is finally encountered as the last quest of 4 Ultimate Hiring Village. In the last quest, it is fought in the Battle Quarters. However, the fight is quite telegraphed and rather anticlimactic. The Ace Hunters are all there during the fight and will give prompts and commands during the course of the hunt, guiding the hunter. The hunt ends with the players activating the Demolisher, hitting Rastakushala. From where a cutscene plays, showing Rastakushala waking up again and attacking the Ace Hunters. Kushala then flees the battle quarters and the end credits roll. Rastakushala is Kushala that has failed to molt or shed its metallic exterior. This means that it is much more aggressive than a regular Kushala and is looking for a place to molt and put itself in a more vulnerable state. This is because Molt of Kushala have a white hide that takes time to develop into the tough metallic exterior it is known for. Rusted Kushala's roar only requires earplugs to block, and it has a tougher hide than that of regular Kushala Deora. Rusted Kushala has one different attack from base Kushala Deora. It does a short range charge bite, chaining it up to three times. Other than that, Rusted Kushala has a series of other moves, ranging from claw swipes, slams, summoning tornadoes, and breath attacks in the same manner regular Kushala does. I found that when you hunt Rusted Kushala in G rank and the polar field, it's on crack. Genuinely, it moves around so much it's hard to deal with. During the specific hunt in the background, I used all of my healing, and we were on our last cart, so it certainly felt more difficult than any other version of Rusted Kushala I have fought. Monsanto 4 Ultimate's iteration of Rusted Kushala is the most recent version of Rusted Kushala in the series, so I'd like to see it return in a newer game, perhaps Monsanto Wild. I think it'd be a good fit alongside regular Kushala. The Ancestral Dragon. White Fatalis is the final Fatalis in the Fatalis Trio and is considered an ancestor of Fatalis. And amongst the Elder Dragons, it's considered a dangerous first class monster or black dragon. White Fatalis stands at 4,119.2 centimeters and uses the thunder and dragon elements, but is weakest to the dragon and fire elements. Physically, White Fatalis's hide is adorned with bright scales. It also has a white mane going all the way from its head to its tail. Like the other two Fatalises, White Fatalis' head is breakable twice, its chest once, and its wings once. White Fatalis is fought in a different location in Monsanto 4 Ultimate than in 2nd Gen, as it is now fought in the newly updated Castle Shrade, not the Tower Summit. In 4 Ultimate, White Fatalis is part of a DLC quest. It is part of an episodic quest line called Lay of the Land, there are three quests in the questline. The first one requires the player to kill 40 Remobra in Heaven's Mount, then kill a Camellios in the Battle Quarters, and then finally kill a White Fatalis. The White Fatalis fight in Gen 4 finally starts to live up to the banger of a theme that accompanies the fight. White Fatalis' theme is amazing, and I've always loved it, even from the start of my Monster Hunter journey. The intro cutscene for the White Fatalis fight really shows the reputation that White Fatalis has accrued over time. At the beginning of the cutscene, a solar eclipse occurs over Castle Shrade. Once the eclipse occurs, all hell breaks loose. The eclipse is transformed into a portal from which White Fatalis flies out of, barreling towards the hunter. Once it gets close, the theme begins in the background, truly showing the power of this godlike creature. Amongst a world of monsters, it stands at the top. There were quite a few changes from the second gen fight. White Fatalis can now be repelled. 
However, if it is repelled, it'll be back at full health the next time it is fought, with all its broken parts repaired. White Fatalis gained a few new moves to add to its moveset, including a powerful electrical blast which is spread over a large amount of area, similar to Dia Morales' fireball attack, and another attack which it borrows from Fatalis, where it will bite players standing on the Dragonator platform inflicting Dragon Blight. White Fatalis' other attacks include a Claw Swipe imbued with Red Lightning, a Breath Attack where it spreads lightning out of its mouth in a similar way to how Fatalis and Crimson Fatalis spread their explosive powder, a Dive Bomb Attack targeting players, the Snap and Drag, and it can summon lightning strikes in a similar manner to how Crimson Fatalis summons Meteors, i.e. via Roaring. White Fatalis will still do the attack where it summons waves of lightning around the area, covering a large area and dealing a lot of damage. However, instead of White Fatalis perching on top of a structure, White Fatalis flies around in the eclipse above Castle Shrade. At the end of the attack, White Fatalis will dive bomb the ground, flying in at a blazing speed. It will land at the same spot each time, so players can align their attacks to the head right when White Fatalis lands for some opportunities to deal damage. When White Fatalis is enraged, its chest will glow red, having thunder crackling and being discharged. The chest and head will remain weak spots whenever White Fatalis is enraged, which sucks because they are generally the two places you don't want to stand when fighting White Fatalis, as it leaves you the most vulnerable to a whole host of high damage attacks. For Ultimate's version of White Fatalis, like the other two, really modernizes the whole fight, bringing a previously old and slightly buggy fight to the limelight in its new 4th gen iteration. All Elders introduced and returning in Monster Hunter 4 were in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. 4 Ultimate added G-Rank for all of Monster Hunter 4's Elders. I've already talked about the important G-Rank changes for these Elder Dragons in Monster Hunter 4 and will not be doing so in this section as it'd be redundant. Monsanto Generations, released on the 28th of November 2015 for the 3DS. It is a game celebrating the Monsanto series. It's the culmination of all the previous games in the series, and it brings together monsters from the 1st gen, 2nd gen, 3rd gen, and 4th gen into one central location. It has the most villages of any Monsanto game up to that point, with Kokoto Village from Gen 1, Pokey Village from Gen 2, Yukimo from Gen 3, and Burner Village, which was introduced in Monsanto Generations. Monsanto Generations continued the theme of the 3DS Monsanto games, with Gen taking a lot of inspiration in its designs from 4 and 4 Ultimate. There was also a couple new gameplay systems that were introduced in Generations and in Generations Ultimate, hunting styles and hunting arts. There is one new Elder Dragon in Monsanto Generations, Nakakos. Alongside the singular new Elder Dragon, there are seven other Elder Dragons returning from 3rd and 4th gen. Kirin, Kushala Deora, Camellios, Teostra, Alatrian, Amatsu, and Shigaru. I'm only going to talk about the Monsanto GU iterations of the Monsanto Generations Elders, like I did with the Monsanto 4 Elders just to save time and effort. Nakakos is an Elder Dragon, similar in appearance to a cephalopod. Its English title is the Corpse Dragon, and it's a large Elder Dragon at 3547.57 cm. Nakakos is covered in a bone-like shell. It has two main tentacles that it uses to attack the hunter. The tentacles are covered in bone and have skulls on the end, giving the appearance that Nakakos has two heads on the end of its tentacles. Nakakos visually has yellowish eyes and a large beak. It is fought in a unique location called the Wyvern's End. It is an interesting area, as the base camp is located on the edge of the area, with the wide expanse of the void that is Wyvern's End looming in the horizon. It's really pretty to look at though, 
especially due to the fact that camp is located above the clouds, so the hunter has to jump into Wyvern's End to get to the fight. In contrast with the pretty base camp, the main area of Wyvern's End is a dark, gloomy and solitary place, mostly characterised by the bones littering the area. It is connected to a large body of water, and serves as Nakakos' main lair, with Nakakos switching from land to sea during the fight. Nakakos has the ability to use quite a lot of ailments during the fight, including Fire Blight, Thunder Blight, Blast Blight, Dragon Blight, Paralysis, and two statuses unique to the fight, Mucus and Ossified. If inflicted with the Mucus ailment, the player turns blue, and if the Hunter rolls in the bones located in the area, it will turn into the Ossified status, which acts like the Snowman status. However, instead of being covered in snow, it impedes the player with bones. Both mucus and ossified can be cured in the same ways, by using a cleanser to remove it instantly, tilting the stick rapidly to get rid of the status quicker, or getting hit by anything, which will remove the status. Despite being able to use a series of ailments, it can only use one element, the dragon element. Nakakos is a very deadly monster, and is able to use its mucus to capture and eat other monsters, ranging from small monsters to more dangerous large monsters. Nikakos' description reads, Frighteningly little is known about this elder dragon, whose appetite can devastate surrounding ecosystems. After covering its prey in a repulsive mucus, it has been seen dragging them back to feast in its macabre nest of bones, an undulating darkness known as Wyvern's End. In the fight, it is possible to break Nikakos' tentacles, back, face tentacles and beak, and its roar requires high grain earplugs in order to nullify. The Nakako's fight is quite laid and complex, and will take some time to pick apart. I enjoy the fight personally, and fighting it for this video has given me a deeper appreciation for the novel experience that fighting Nakako's provides. At the start of the quest, hunters are given binders and ballista ammo in the item box, alongside cleansers to cure mucus and ossified, pickaxes to mine its back, Sonic Bombs, Trank Bombs, Anti-Dragon Bombs, and all other typical item box items like potions and rations. Within Wyvern's End, the player has access to Ballista and is able to use Ballista Ammo and One-Shot Binders that can restrain a carcass during the fight for good at damage opportunities. However, even if the Hunter forgets to grab Ballista Ammo or One-Shot Binders from the item box, they can pick up Nakakos' Shinies, which will drop Ballista Ammo. During the fight, Nikakos can use the aspects of large monsters it has killed against the hunter, such as Glavinus, both its head and tail, Uragan, Brachy, and Legiacris, taking on each monster's different abilities. Glavinus is fire, Brachy's blast, Legiacris is thunder, and Uragan's jaw. It does this by attaching different parts of those monsters at the end instead of the tentacles. Strategies for the fight in phase one would be attacking the tentacles as they take more damage, alongside the weak spot on the back whenever it is downed, which isn't easy to spot due to its bright colours. Along with this, the player should take any damage opportunities that are presented, as Nakakos tends to be more elusive in the second phase. The attacks in phase 1 that Nakakos can do include roaring, swiping its tentacles at hunters, burrowing underground and attacking with its tentacles. Other attacks include firing mucus beams with its tentacles, swimming in the water alongside the edge of Wyvern's End, shooting globs of mucus out of its paws on its side, as well as shooting laser beams of mucus out of its main tentacles. Nakakos can be flinched quite a bit in the first phase, and it can even be knocked over completely onto its side, presenting the colourful weak spot on its back. In the first phase, something to be mindful of is that on the sides of Nakakos' body, it is covered in a blue mist that slowly saps the health of the hunter. The Phase 1 theme accompanies Nakakos' pace and attacks, as it is a lot slower and more meandering than the upbeat revelatory theme of the second phase. It is difficult to see a whole lot of Nakakos in the first phase. The hunter mostly sees the main two tentacles and its spiny back lined with spikes. At the beginning of the second phase, the music will change and the true version of Nakakos will reveal itself in all its tentacly glory. The underbelly of Nakakos will be revealed showing that the tentacles are merely a facade, and the true fight has begun. Whenever Nakakos is enraged in the second phase, the entire area will become bioluminescent, turning a bright blue, lighting up what used to be a dark, gloomy area. 
Alongside this, parts of Nakakos' originally blue body will start to glow red, primarily around the previously blue bioluminescent dots. At the beginning of Phase 2, Nakakos will also start spewing a bluish mist out of its mouth that saps away the player's health over time. It can be mitigated by attacking a primary tentacle until it goes away for a period of time. Nakagos can be toppled during Phase 2, and its back can be climbed. Arrows will appear guiding hunters to its back. From here, the hunter can mine on the back, plant anti-dragon bombs on its back, or attack the glowing spot, as it is a weak spot. During Phase 2, the strategy should be to attack a tentacle until it retreats, then attack the face, as it won't be spewing blue mist. The list of attacks Nakakos can perform in Phase 2 include roaring, digging its tentacles into the ground, and swiping its tentacles at the players. When it is close to death, one attack Nakakos will do involves firing a beam made of dragon element from its mouth. This beam does a lot of damage if it successfully connects with the hunters, having the potential to wipe entire hunting groups. Nakakos charges up this beam when its shell starts to glow a whole range of different colours. Its face will start to crackle with dragon energy. Right when it's about to fire the beam, the carcass will roar. Its shell will start glowing a myriad of colors. Following this, it will plant its tentacles into the ground and fire the beam, moving it in a direction practically one-shotting players if they get hit. The carcass can also shoot mini laser beams from the skulls on its tentacles. It only does this when it is charging up the big main beam. The small beams deal a lot of damage as well. On top of this, beams can burst from the floor when the carcass is charging its laser. At the end of the fight when Nakakos is killed, it will fire one of its beams at the top of Wyvern's End, causing the walls around Wyvern's End to fall, letting sunlight into this previously sordid place. Some things to use against Nakakos are Trank Bombs and Sonic Bombs. Trank Bombs will stop it from using its giant beam. Interestingly, this is something it shares in common with Yamatsukami, as Yamatsukami's big wind vortex attack can also be stopped by using a Trank Bomb. Sonic Bombs destroy the current monster part it is using reverting the tentacles to their original bony vertebrae. Whenever Nakakos is flinched, it will drop Ballista ammo as a shiny. In G-Rank, Nakakos will start in Phase 2, and then revert back to the first phase after a certain amount of damage is dealt. G-Rank Nakakos is unlocked at Hunter Rank 50. Overall, the Nakakos fight was certainly one of the more complex fights to cover in this series. I personally enjoy its second phase, and especially the climax at the end with the beam shaking things up, potentially catching players off guard. I would like to see Nakakos return in a future Monster Hunter game. It is one of the top Gen 4 Elder Dragons in my opinion. Monster Hunter Generations returning elders consist of one elder originally from Gen 1, three elders originally from Gen 2, two elders from Gen 3, and one elder from Gen 4. This is a pretty even divide across the generations, and makes Monster Hunter Generations roster relatively balanced, which I like. It means it doesn't suffer from one of GU's problems, which was a bloated roster. Overall, Monster Hunter Generations is a nice celebration of the series, which was expanded upon in Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate. Kirin doesn't have a whole lot of changes to discuss for Monster Hunter Generations, as I went through a lot of its 4th gen changes in the Monster Hunter 4 segment. In Monster Hunter Generations and Monster Hunter GU, Kirin is now fightable in the Jurassic Frontier, Arctic Ridge, Ruined Pinnacle, and Forlorn Arena. Its in-game description for Monster Hunter Generations remains the same as when it was in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. There is only one change worth noting with Kirin's transition from 4 Ultimate to Monster Hunter Generations. Now whenever Kirin is in a hunting locale, there will now be no more small monsters present. This is good, as Kirin was an inconsistency to this phenomenon of all small monsters disappearing whenever an Elder Dragon was present. This had been the case since its introduction in the series. Apart from that, there aren't any changes of note. Kirin's horn is still the only part of the body that is breakable, it still uses its thunder attacks to reckless abandon, and it can inflict paralysis and thunder blight.
Kushala, like most other returning elders in Monsanto Generations, didn't change much, as the majority of the returning elders in Generations were also from 4 Ultimate. In Monsanto Generations and GU, Kushala is encounterable in the Frozen Seaway, Arctic Ridge, Dunes, and Jungle. Its in-game description stayed the same from 4 Ultimate. Just like Kirin, there is only one noteworthy change to Kushala in Generations. Kushala has now gained the ability to inflict Dragon Blight, and can once again wield the Dragon Element, as it was unable to in 4 Ultimate. There isn't much to say about Camellios. In Generations and GU, it is now encounterable in the Verdant Hills, Primal Forest, Ancestral Steppe, Marshlands, Ruined Pinnacle, and the Fallen Arena. The fight remains unchanged from 4 Ultimate, so there isn't anything to say. Teostra remains the same. In Generations and GU, it can now be fought in Ingle Isle, the Dunes, and the Volcanic Hollow. The fight is still unchanged from 4 Ultimate, with Teostra's 4th gen moveset remaining intact. Now we're finally onto a returning Elder Dragon that has received more than two changes in generations. Latrine is a dangerous first class monster, or Black Dragon, that was introduced in Monster Hunter Tri, and is 3105 centimeters. In Monster Hunter Generations and Generations Ultimate, Latrine is fightable in Ingle Isle, and is no longer fightable in the Sacred Land, which kinda sucks, because I personally like the Sacred Land, particularly in 3 Ultimate. Latrine's in-game description for Monster Hunter Generations remains the same as its description for 3 Ultimate, which I personally find interesting. Why did they change Teostra's, Kushala's, Kirin's, and Camellios' in-game description when they were brought to 4th gen, but not Alatrian's? Alatrian has a specific unlock condition in Generations, which is that it is unlocked when the Hunter reaches Hunt rank 80. Alatrian's fight remains the same as it when it was in 3 Ultimate, with Flight Mode and Ground Mode still being aspects of the fight. Alatrian still has the same moves that it had in 3rd gen, including shooting fireballs, spraying icicles out of its mouth, and charging towards the hunter. Amatsu was brought back for Monster Hunter Generations in its first appearance for Western Monster Hunter fans. Amatsu is 3133.8cm and was initially introduced in the Japanese exclusive Monster Hunter Portable 3rd. Amatsu is able to use the water element and inflicts water blight. Amatsu has a series of fins that line its body alongside fleshy tendrils and giant horns that adorn its face and head. Amatsu's hide is mostly white with its underbelly being grey and scaly. Matsu has fought on the Sacred Pinnacle in Generations and Generations Ultimate, the same location as its fight in Monster Hunter Portable 3rd. Its description in Generations is as follows. A legendary Elder Dragon spotted on the Sacred Pinnacle, an avatar of storms in the folklore of Yukimo Village, and Matsu's appearance is accompanied by furious cyclones and horrific storms. Its fearsome power is said to outscale that of natural disasters. In Generations, Matsu is unlocked at Hunter Rank 70. Amatsu's fight in Monster Hunter Generations is very similar to its fight in Monster Hunter Portable 3rd. The strategy for the fight remains the same. Beware of the tornadoes that Amatsu summons during the course of the fight, and watch out for all its other attacks, mainly water beams and its wind vortex. As I previously mentioned in part 3 of the series, I really like Amatsu's theme, 
in particular the second phase, which intensifies alongside the battle. It's the only new elder from Monster Hunter 4 and 4 Ultimate to return in Monster Hunter Generations, and it follows the general trend of elders in Generations having almost no changes of note. It's still fought in the Sanctuary. Shigaru was fought at the end of Low Rank Village in a quest called Stop the Wheel, once again referencing Shigaru's reincarnation motive. Apart from that, there isn't any other thing of note. Monster Hunter GU, also known as Monster Hunter Double Cross, is the G-Rank expansion to Monster Hunter Generations and was released in March 2017 initially, but was released for Western markets in August 2018. There was one brand new Elder Dragon added to Monster Hunter Generations, and four new returning Elder Dragons. Veltrax is most simply put, a jet engine as a dragon, and is one of the flagships of Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate, alongside Bloodbath Diablos. Veltrax has a sleek design, it's hide lined with silver scales, and has wings that are literally jet engines for lack of a better word. Veltrax mainly uses the dragon element, which means it can inflict dragon blight. It is weakest to the fire, water, thunder, and ice elements. Veltrax is also the final boss of Monster Hunter GU's high rank village, is the story revolves around locating and taking down Valstrax. Valstrax ranges between sizes of 2698.15 cm to 2267cm. It is able to be fought in the jungle, desert, forlorn arena, frozen seaway, marshlands, Jurassic Frontier, Arctic Ridge, and Ruined Pinnacle. Despite it being able to be fought in so many locations, Valstrax has the closest relationship with the Ruined Pinnacle. Its in-game description reads, an elder dragon that soars at very high altitudes far from human habitation. Its flaming red wings are often the only visible sign of it, giving rise to its nickname, the Argent Comet. Those wings aren't just for flying though, and are easily used to stab, rend, and blow away its enemies. Occasionally, one can find the scorched shells it has left behind. A number of Valstrax's parts can be broken, including its head, wings, chest, back, claws and its tail can be severed. Valstrax has some really unique weapons, with the sharpness gauges having white sharpness and then immediately going down to red sharpness with no intermediary sharpness levels. Its roar requires high grade earplugs to block. Valstrax is in a unique position in Generations, as just like Nakakos, who is the only new Elder Dragon in Generations, Valstrax is the only new Elder Dragon in Monsanto Generations Ultimate. The fight certainly lives up to expectations with Valstrax being a fan favourite monster. Valstrax attacks with its wings depend on what direction they're facing. If the wings are in their normal state with the jets facing backwards, Valstrax can hit hunters with its wings striking them, and spinning towards the hunter with its wings in a slashing AoE attack. When Valstrax's jets are facing forward, it can shoot blasts of dragon element at the hunter tracking them. It can also do focused blasts and patterns, and will slam its wings onto the ground. Valstrax at times during the hunt will absorb air into its chest. If the chest is attacked enough, Valstrax's chest will explode, toppling it over and dropping a shiny. Valstrax has an ultimate move called Around the World, 
where it intakes a lot of air, inhaling a lot of air through its chest. After this, it flies into the air, twirls around in a circle engulfed in the dragon element, and then crashes down to earth at a speed exceeding the sound barrier, dealing a bunch of damage. Most of the time, also having the potential to one-shot hunters. Thalstrax's theme is one of the most iconic and best themes in the series, having psychotic intro. Overall, I think Thalstrax is a very high stakes fight. With its triumphant feel, it almost feels like a battle theme for a battle deciding the fate of the world. All elders from months on to generations returned. As I've already talked about all the changes of note from the elders in generations, I won't bother mentioning them again. I will only mention the returning elders that are new to months on to generations ultimate. Generations Ultimate marks the first appearance Lausch and Lung has made in the mainline Monster Hunter series since 2008 in Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. They rehauled the fight, and in my opinion, it was for the better. This is my favourite iteration of Lausch and Lung by a long shot, though Frontier's version is pretty cool. Lau no longer has an element, as its ability to use the dragon element was removed in Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate. Its description in GU is, a giant dragon that has only been rarely sighted. It periodically prowls close to inhabited areas, and the damage it causes is comparable to that wreaked by a natural disaster. Its habits are a mystery, and no one knows why it occasionally wanders. The guild has built defensive barricades where they appear, but to what effect? Lau is characterized by its massive size, being 6,960 centimeters, making it one of the largest monsters in the series, and it is distantly related to Zora Magdaros. That has been nicknamed the Walking Natural Disaster and is weakest to the Dragon Element. Apart from that, there isn't much else to Lao that hasn't already been said. A lot changed with the Lao Shenlong fight. From my perspective, it feels like Lao is a lot smaller in GU, even though the size of it hasn't changed canonically. At the start of the fight, players will spawn inside the fortress rather than on the outside, immediately differentiating the fight. As in all previous versions, the fight starts outside the fortress. In the item box, hunters have access to maps, potions, rations, mini whetstones, one-shot binders, ballista ammo, bombs, anti-dragon bombs, and dense marcoal. The fortress has changed so that there are only two areas, not including the camp, that the player fight Lao. The first area was changed significantly, with the cart on rails being present in both area 1 and 2. The cannon has the ability to be moved in line with Lao, as it trundles through the areas of the fight. The first area also has several ballista, which can be used to bind Lao or shoot at it, as well as a demolisher, which needs dense mar coal to be used, dealing massive damage in a fiery explosion. The blast radius for the demolisher is marked in a circle, in order to help players gauge when they need to activate it. The start of the fight begins with Lao Shen Lung at the bottom half of area 1, Player should load the cannon cart with cannonballs. They are easy to load, as player can load them in groups of three balls rather than the singular cannonball, like in previous games. There are two different elevations during the fight, and thusly two ways of attacking Lao in Area 1. Players can opt to shoot Lao with the cannon cart as it goes through, or attack its head, belly, and feet down on the ground. Like in previous versions of the fortress, there are rocks lining the edge of the area. They still fall onto the ground during the fight, however, they deal damage to the players in GU. Lao still takes a long time to get through Area 1, that part of the fight, with the continuous long stretches of doing the same attacks over and over, hasn't changed much. In Area 1, it is possible to fail the quest, if players don't protect the front barricade. The player needs to protect the fortress in both Areas 1 and 2, with the front barricade being in Area 1, and the main barricade being in Area 2. If either one of the front or main barricade's integrity drops to 0%, the fortress is destroyed and the player fails the quest. 
Once Lao reaches the end of Area 1, a message will pop up on the screen saying, follow the Lao Shen Lung to Area 2. Area 2 of the fortress was changed significantly from previous iterations, housing a giant bridge with rails and an elevated platform made of stone lining the fortress walls. In Area 2, the player will have access to a few different battlements. They still have access to a cannon cart and ballista, but on top of that, the players can use a Dragonator located at the end of the area. In Area 2, the strategy for the fight is to attack Lao either with your weapon or the battlements. When Lao goes under the bridge, the player can move the cannon cart to the top of the bridge and fire cannonballs at Lao. Another thing to do when Lao is under the bridge is to jump onto its back and carve materials off of it, as well as place down the anti-dragon bombs that the players were given at the start of the quest in the item box. Instead of crawling onto Lao Shen Lung's back awkwardly, the players now walk on its back. After that, the players can use the Dragonator whenever Lao gets too close to the fortress, creating the potential to deal a lot of damage. After the Dragonator is used, the music will once again change to Proof of a Hero, a nice callback to Lao's fight in Monster Hunter 1, where Proof of a Hero plays after the Dragonator is activated. Apart from those strategies mentioned previously, the player should just attack Lao until it dies via the battlements or using their own weapons. Just make sure not to let the fortress's integrity drop to 0%. During the course of the fight, Lao only has 4 attacks that it can use. They include roaring, which we will do quite frequently during the fight, belly flopping onto the ground, side swiping the fortress and slamming his head against the fortress. Another change from previous versions of Lao is how many times it can be carved. Now the amount of cards available at the end of the hunt are more similar to monsters like Gem Moran or Daran Moran, as Lao can only be carved 8 times, 4 on the body and 4 on the head. This was changed from all previous versions of Lao, in which it could be carved 9 times in total, 3 on the head, 3 on the upper body and 3 on the lower body. Lao Shen Long can be fought for the first time in GU in G rank, as the G2 urgent quest to unlock G3. Overall, I really enjoyed the Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate Lao Shen Lung fight. It's a great reinterpretation of a previously rather repetitive and monotonous fight. Even despite its shiny new overhaul, I'm not 100% sure I'd like to see it return in the future. Fatalis is still fought in the Monster Hunter 4 updated Castle Shrade, so not a whole lot changed about the fight. Its in-game description is still the same as it was in 4 Ultimate. Even though Fatalis is not present in Monster Hunter Generations as a fightable monster, its weapons and armor are still craftable because of the giant sword in Pokey Village, from which players are able to mine from and receive Fatalis materials. Fatalis is unlocked at Hunter Rank 90 in Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate. All three Fatalis now have a super powerful event quest, in which it deals more damage to players, making it a decent challenge. No other changes are of note apart from that. Crimson Fatalis is once again fought in Ingle Isle, with almost nothing changing from its previous 4 Ultimate iteration. Crimson Fatalis is unlocked in High Rank 95 in GU. The special G Rank Crimson Fatalis present in 4 Ultimate was not brought over to GU, so the regular version of Crimson Fatalis' fight is in GU.
White Fatalis has fought at Castle Strayed once again, and you guys know the drill, nothing important changed for White Fatalis from 4 Ultimate to GU. White Fatalis was unlocked at Hunter Rank 100 in GU. Generation 4 had the largest collection of Elder Dragons in the series up until that point, with many returning Elders from Gen 1 and 2 returning in Gen 4. I think most of the Elder Dragons fights in Gen 4 benefit from the increased focus on verticality seen in its map designs. The Elder Dragons in 4th Gen include some of the most overlooked and forgotten Elders, like Oroshi Kirin and Nakakos. There seems to be less discourse about these Elders, which is a shame, as they definitely have their strengths and fit the role of an Elder Dragon well. The new Elders added in 4 and 4 Ultimate are some of my favourites in the series, both design-wise and fight-wise. With monsters like Dalamadur, Gogmazios and Daran Moran, 4 and 4 Ultimate have Elders that are serious contenders for the best Elders in the series. I'd also like to mention, as a closing remark, this is the longest video I've done, so I'd really appreciate it if you subscribed and liked the video. Gen 5 is on its way, and like Gen 4, it's going to be a long one, as I'm covering World, Iceborne, Rise, and Sunbreak's Elder Dragons. I also wanted to thank everyone for the newest milestone the channel hit, 1k subs is nothing to joke about. On top of that, I'd like to thank Serpent Hunter for hunting with so many of the 4th Gen Elders with me. I probably wouldn't have beaten all the monsters as quickly or as easily without your help. This series now has become quite a monumental effort, so once again, if I've made any mistakes or missed anything, let me know in the comments. I appreciate all the feedback given. Alright everyone, I'll see you in the next one. Hopefully it comes out quicker than the previous four parts. <laughs>